Philippians 3.18, he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. If you will, bow your heads with me. Father, we thank You for this day, Lord. We thank You for all Your many blessings, Lord. We, we thank You, Lord, as always, for each one that's come out, Lord. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that You just bless each one this morning, Lord. Lord, let Your Spirit, Lord, have full reign here this morning, Lord. Just uh, let Your Word of God have free course this morning, Lord. Let it go out, Lord, freely. Lord, let it accomplish that which You'd have it to do, Lord. We know that it don't return unto You void. And Lord, we ask that You'd meet every need here this morning, Lord. And most of all, Lord, we ask You, Lord, that if there's one that that don't know You, Lord, that You'd convict and deal with them, Lord. Just uh, anoint them now to hear this message and to receive it, Lord. Lord, it's all these things that we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. And amen. Alright. He's, Paul has given him a warning here, and uh, he, he's wrote this letter to the Philippians, and he's wrote it from prison. He's in prison somewhere uh, while he's wrote this. And a lot of the stuff that Paul wrote, you read through there, and unless he says something about being in bonds or being in prison or something like that, you'd never, you'd never guess that he was in prison because he, he seems to have such a, a great outlook and all that. And uh, right off the bat, we see there that, that we need to examine our attitudes. Paul had a, a better attitude in prison than a lot of us have just going through everyday life and, and enjoying a lot of blessings of life and all that. But Paul wrote him this letter, like I said, from prison to the Philippian church. And uh, he, he speaks well to this church here. But he also gives them a warning down here in verse or chapter 3. And he tells them that, uh, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. Now he's talking about uh, a group of false teachers that started to come into the church, started to go around, and uh, they're teaching another uh, doctrine, another gospel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and Paul says that he's told them, he's warned them often of it here. And I, I know maybe we uh, mention this pretty often in the church, but it bears mentioning. Paul mentions it often also. And he says, I tell you this, uh, even weeping. He's broken about this uh, because Paul has a, a concern for his uh, church, for the churches. Uh, for the Christian people, for those coming up in the Lord and all that. Uh, Sharon and me were talking last night and I said, you know, I think a lot of the difference uh, in, in in pastors, preachers, whatever, is, is there's really a... Uh, and you can just about point them out. There is a group of them who really care about the church and care about uh, everything going on in the church. And then there's another group that's just there uh, just to fill a position, maybe, uh, you know, for whatever reason. But uh, he tells them there, he says, I'm telling you this weeping. I'm broken about this. I'm concerned about this. Uh, and uh, a lot of times I think us as the church, uh, we fail to have a concern. And uh, we're, we're so busy anymore. And you guys bear with me. I may ramble a minute here, but we're so busy anymore. The world's got so much to offer us, and and we, we've got uh, we've got jobs and homes and uh, f- favorite TV shows and <laughs> all kinds of stuff that we just can't hardly miss, you know. And uh, everything going on, and it seems like we, we're always uh, procrastinating a little bit. Well, Lord, uh, let me get this done, and then I'll pray. You know, let me uh, let me finish this, and I'm going to read for a while. I'll start to study a little while whatever it is and it seems like down at the end of the day we've run out of airs in the day you know Roseanne told me a while back that I needed to make time for something I said that's one thing I can't do uh, you know there's only 24 hours in the day and you can't make any more uh, if you can't fit in whatever you got to do in those 24 you're just out of luck you know uh, but just kind of teasing her a little bit there but we run out of airs we run out of, of energy and time and all that kind of stuff and it seems like we, we put everything of God off until the last minute of the day, and then we're so worn out in body and, and just so tired that we can't do what we promised God that we would do. Lord, you know, I mean, there's, and I'll just tell me this morning, there's been times when God has dealt with me. Uh, you need to pray. You need to put in some extra time today, pray and study, whatever it may be. Okay, Lord, I will. Let me get this done first. And it seems like you get right down at the end of the day and you're, you're trying to do that thing, but you're just out of steam. You know, you're down there. You can't hold your eyes open. 
open, you're trying to pray and all that, you've neglected the things of God for the things of the world. I think the church today has lost the concern that we should have for the things of God, for the people of God, for the lost. Jeremy mentioned that. If I've got the fire of God, if I've got the Spirit dwelling in me, I should have a concern for the lost people. You know, there should be something driving me to bring this Word unto them and all that. And listen, now here's the here's the bad thing about this. Just because we're not reaching these people uh, don't mean that nobody is reaching them. Paul tells them uh, that many walk of whom, of whom I have told you often and now tell you weeping. Well, who's he talking about? This is who's going to reach these people if we don't, folks. Uh, he says that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, uh, this cross, and, and Jeremy mentioned this, and, and Josh Hamby told us this down there uh, that day in, in that school of Christ that we went to, uh, he said that the cross is an instrument of death. Amen? You guys look quiet. You're quiet on me already. The cross is an instrument of death. I know we got nice, smooth, sanded crosses up here, but that's not what they were intended to be in the beginning. The cross is an instrument of death. And now, Paul tells them here, he's warning them of a people who are, what? They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Well, let's, uh, we're going to look at that this morning a little bit. What does it mean to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? Well, the cross of Christ, uh, we know that in His time, He, he was tried all this uh, according to the plan of God, uh, everything that God had intended from the foundation of the world. Uh, Christ was meant to go to that cross, and that cross uh, was meant to bring death to His physical body. It was meant to kill Him, uh, and it did that very thing. He, he died on the cross, of course, raised again. We all know this. Uh, but here we are. What does the cross of Christ mean in our life? Well, uh, the cross is still an instrument of death. Uh, it's, it's just like it was in the time of Christ there. Uh, the cross is still supposed to bring this carnal man uh, to a place of death so that the spiritual man uh, can rule over that carnal man. Amen? It's still supposed to be a place of death. But Paul warns him and he says, look, I'm warning you, I'm telling you again here, I'm even, I'm weeping with this, uh, that there are, there are many people walking who are enemies of this cross of Christ. Well, we look around in our churches today and you, you turn on the, uh, what's supposed to be the Christian television, all that kind of, all these, uh, supposed to be, uh, great teachers, popular people and all that, uh, they are no longer teaching anything about a cross that's going to bring this carnal man to a place of death. No. Anymore, the teaching has got so weak in the churches, in the Christian television, the circles, all this kind of stuff. It's become so weak to the point that they no longer tell you all oh, this, this salvation should be a life-changing event. And not only a life-changing event, but a life-changing event for the rest of your life. Amen. Amen. Until you die, folks. Until they lay this body in the ground. Uh, there should be a desire for God and there should be a longing for Him and something causing you to want to move up. Uh, something causing you to want more and more of Him. You know, I pray like that a lot of times. Uh, God, just give me more of You. Lord, I need more of You. Uh, give me more of You. And I think a lot of times uh, if, if God would speak to me during that very instant right there, He'd probably say, uh, look, I'll give you all of me that you want, uh, but you have to come and get it, buddy. You know, you're not just going to pray to me uh, uh, five, ten minutes a day, beg me for more of me, uh, and me give it. I'm telling you, a lot of times we're asking God for something uh, that we don't want bad enough to get it, folks. Amen. Amen. They're enemies of the cross. People don't teach anymore that this Word is perfect, that this Word is inspired. But this is the, the, the Word of God, folks. Not to be changed. Not to be uh, messed with. Not to be, nothing to be taken out. Uh, nothing to be added to. They don't teach that anymore. Uh, you turn on your TV set, and, and I hardly ever watch anything on the television, any of the, the preaching or teaching like that on there, because there's so much uh, stuff on there that's false that I find it just, uh, it's difficult for me to keep my attention on it long enough uh, to sort out the good from the bad. Yeah. 
But you turn this stuff on, and at best what we've got are motivational speakers on television uh, standing there with the title of, of preacher or pastor. They're, they're just motivational speakers. Uh, they're up there telling you, oh, uh, you can't lose. Oh, uh, God wants to bless you. Oh, oh God loves everybody. All oh, that. I agree. Uh, he's loved us enough that He's given His Son to die for us. Uh, but there's also a place that you can reach, folks, where you're turned over to that reprobate mind. Uh, God spoke plainly. He said, he said that God hated Esau uh, because that He sold His birthright for a morsel of meat there that day. He traded what was eternal uh, for something that was temporal. And when we get to that place, folks, uh, we are not. The, the love of God may be there, but we're not abiding in that love. Amen. Am I losing everybody? Everybody. I've struggled with it, I'll be honest with you. But here they are. They're, they're enemies of this cross. They don't teach what this cross is anymore. And you know, he said, take up your cross daily. What does it mean? Paul said also, I die daily. To take up that cross daily is to reach that place of death for this carnal man uh, every day. To die daily, just like Paul spoke. Uh, he, he goes on there. He said, uh, talks about these people whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Now, I looked up this word belly, just Webster's. Uh, two of the definitions of the word belly uh, are one, the womb, and another one there was the appetite, appetite for food. But here we are uh, looking at it in a, a spiritual sense this morning. And it said, whose God is their belly. Uh, well, their God is that own womb, that own place that's supposed to bring forth life. Uh, it's that own appetite, folks. Their God has become that. And... You know, I hit on this the other night. I don't want to go into as much detail as I did the other night because I feel like I really rubbed some people wrong. But here we are looking at this appetite, looking at the appetite of the flesh and all that's taking our time. And Josh Madden one time, you know, we was talking about something, trying to get somebody to come to church, something like that. I don't remember what the situation was exactly, but everybody we talked to, their excuse was, well, I'm just too busy. Busy. I'm busy. Everywhere you went, I'm busy. Uh, and Josh finally, he, he just spoke up there. He said, busy. Uh, burdened under Satan's yoke. You know, he just come up with a little, what do they call them? Uh, acronym for that. Burdened under Satan's yoke. Uh, and we are busy, folks. You look around, we're busy. A year or two ago, Lucas, uh, he played baseball. Uh, I didn't make him quit, by the way. He just said that he didn't want to go. Uh, but any time that that started to interfere with my servant of God, uh, we didn't go to the baseball game. And, and I sent a message to some of the people that was over the scheduling of that, those little baseball games and all this. Uh, I said, look, is there any way that you can stop scheduling baseball games on Wednesdays? Uh, I said, a lot of people have church on Wednesdays. It makes it hard on us. Uh, where our children have to miss games. All this. I, I never got a reply and they never stopped scheduling on Wednesdays. Folks, they didn't pay any attention to that at all. Uh, so we just didn't go anymore. You know, uh, but so many of us, our, our children have things going on. There's ball games. There's school activities. There's everything. Uh, there is the favorite TV show. There's the uh, the bed sheet on Sunday morning. You know, I talk about that every now and then. Ain't no grave uh, going to hold my body down, but I can't get out from under a bed sheet on Sunday morning, uh, all that kind of stuff, folks, I'm telling you, uh, we need to do an examination of ourselves and we need to find out uh, who it is that we're actually serving. Is it God or is it our own appetite? Is it us or is it Him? Do we care more about what we think or what God thinks? Do we care about uh, what is important to us or what's important to God? Now that's a, a big question this morning. And that can apply. You say, well, I'm here. It's Sunday and I'm here. Oh, listen. Uh, this can apply anywhere, folks. This applies when you crawl out of that bed of a morning. This applies when you're in that workplace, uh, when you're in that home alone. There's nobody else around to see what you're doing. Uh, this applies every single minute. When that person uh, comes to you that you just don't like, rubs you the wrong way, this applies, folks. Do I care more about what I think or do I care more about what God thinks? Oh, I'd love to tell them all kinds of stuff. I'd love to just chew them out good. Uh, but do I care more about what God says than what I say? If you go into 
Now, Romans 16, 17 here, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are such, they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but serve their own belly. Well, what are they doing here? It says that they're causing divisions, offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. They have a doctrine. They have a doctrine of their own. They're teaching. They're up there. They're standing behind a podium somewhere. Uh, something's coming out, folks. Somebody somewhere uh, is sitting back there taking notes and they're saying, oh man, uh, this is so good. I, I wish I had thought of this myself. And they're writing that down uh, and that's becoming part of their life and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they don't ever open their Bible. They don't say, turn to so and so. This is what God says or anything like that. They're saying, well, hey, it just don't make sense to look at it like God said. It, it don't look makes sense uh, that God would have a child and let him suffer. We'll hit on that a little bit later maybe, if Lord willing. But they've got a doctrine. It's contrary to what you've learned. He says to avoid them, uh, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They serve that own appetite, that own flesh, folks. Uh, there's lots of people out there. And you look around, uh, it's not hard to find folks. Like I said, you look through the channels, you look through the churches, uh, you look everywhere. There, there's lots of folks out here, uh, millionaires, flying in jets, all that kind of, nothing wrong with all that kind, nothing wrong with having money. Uh, but what would happen if God put on their heart uh, a message like some of the ones that we've had to preach down here lately? Uh, you know, Jeremy talking this morning, I know this is close, he says, and all that, how what would happen if, if God truly dealt with their hearts and told them that they needed to stand before their congregation and say, if you don't turn to God, you're going to die lost and go to hell. Would they stand there and say that thing? Or would they stand there and say, oh, I can't do it. Now, I've got this great salary. I've got this company car, church car, whatever it is. I've got the, the, the parsonage down here, all this. Would they say, no, there's too much for me to lose for me to stand behind that pulpit and tell the truth? Folks, we've got to be careful what we're listening to. Oh, there, there, there's... You say, why do you talk about false teaching so much? Because there's more of that than there is of the true teaching. There's more of that. They serve their own belly, their own appetite. Their God is their belly, folks. And if you go on, he says, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Well, they're not standing up there behind the pulpit. They don't open up their lesson by saying, uh, okay, everybody, uh, may I have your attention, please? I'm going to do a little bit of false teaching up here this morning. Uh, pay close attention. They don't say that at all. They don't stand up there and say, listen, uh, if you'll pay close attention to me and do everything that I tell you to do, uh, you can go to hell and spend eternity separated from God. No, you don't hear that. I've never heard them say that. Never heard them say It says, and by good words and fair speeches, uh, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Folks, they stand up there, uh, they look right, they sound right. Uh, oh, they're, they're, they're friendly, they're nice, they're everything probably that everybody wishes I was this morning, all that. Uh, listen, they, they can get your attention, they can keep your attention, uh, all that kind of stuff. They can rattle off a, a good lesson, something that sounds right, uh, all that, folks. It's by the good words uh, and the fair speeches that they're deceiving many, many dying lost, uh, going to hell, folks. All you got to do, uh, you, you pick out your favorite TV preacher, whatever, get on YouTube, uh, pull them up on YouTube, you'll find probably all kinds of things uh, where somebody has already dug up the dirt on them and posted on there. they got videos uh, of them saying things that are not biblical. I'll give you examples. This morning uh, I've seen two or three different ones where they brought Joel Osteen up. Uh, are homosexuals going to go to heaven? He says, no. I don't know. He don't say no. He says, well, you know, he smiles. You know, that's between them, all this kind of stuff. Uh, listen, the Bible tells me that you must be born again, that this salvation is going to change you. I'm not saying there's no hope for these people, folks. Uh, they just lost like the rest of us was. But I'm telling you this morning, uh, all that kind of stuff, there must be a change in our lives, folks. There must be a change. Send me your money. <laughs> Yeah. I'll send you a prayer rug. 
Yeah. And for 30 extra dollars, I'll activate it. You call me back with a credit card. I'll say the magic words. That thing will do something. You know, I don't know what they're supposed to do. Paul sent parts of his own garment, right? Oh, you call me and I'll cut a piece off my underwear and send to you. You know, I, I don't know. Listen, folks. There's all manner of foolishness being taught. And the problem is people, folks, all kinds of people right in our churches sitting and taking this stuff in. Taking it in. Taking it in. And it'll make sense to you. If you'll sit and listen to it, it'll begin to make sense to you. Their good words and fair speeches will start to sink in and start to make sense to you. It deceives the hearts of the simple. Well, uh, brother, I'm not simple. Well, maybe I'll leave that alone. I just don't know. No, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go. I talked to some. I didn't talk to him. I was reading this. Somebody that was 65 years old got saved when they was 13. 13 to 65. What is that? 52 years of salvation. Listen, they said. I'm not ignorant. I've read the Bible through three times. Fifty-three years of salvation. Fifty-two or three. I've read the Bible through three times. Folks, we're, we're, if we're not simple, <laughs> we're, we're bordering. We're, we're, we're touching the edge of it somehow there, if that's the best we're doing. I mean, and the thing about it is, this person in, in 52 or 3 years who's read the Bible through three times has probably done more than 90% of church members. That's probably more than most people's ever read it. You know? I said something about reading the Bible all the way through one day there, and somebody said, You've read the whole thing? I said, Well, yeah. <laughs> All you know, every bit of it. You know, there was nothing there that I could find that didn't apply. There's nothing there that I could say. Well, I just don't need to read that part of it. Listen, they're going to deceive the hearts of the simple. And if we won't read God's word and we don't know what the real thing is, and we've not studied and we've not learned and all that, then we're simple, and they're going to be able to deceive us. Listen, He's, he goes on. He says, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Now this word simple, he means what he means is ignorant, uh, which is not necessarily an insult. It means uninformed. But he says, I would have you wise to that which is good and simple to that which is evil. In other words, I would just have you completely ignorant of it if I could. I, I would just shield you from all that. I would keep you from knowing anything about that evil thing. And I would just keep you in what's good if I could. But he's over here in prison somewhere else and these false teachers coming in and he can't shield them. So all he can do is teach them and let them know that they need to understand what is the realness of God so that they're not deceived by something that's not real. I can't keep you from evil this morning. Folks, uh, I mean, every outlet, they're popping it into our homes and our cars, uh, our TVs, our radios, uh, our, our, like I said, our workplaces, our schools, all everything. I mean, they're cramming it in everywhere they can get it. I can't keep you from it, but if you'll know the realness of God, you won't be deceived by it. In Colossians 2 and 4, he says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Well, we're going to, if we're beguiled, it's going to be with the enticing words. Now here comes the good words and the fair speech again. He says, uh, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order uh, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. 
Well, in one place he says, if anybody comes to you preaching any other Jesus, any other gospel, let him be accursed. As you received Christ, walk ye in Him. That's the Christ. That's the real Christ. Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Well, we we see again a danger of being beguiled with the enticing words. We, we, he tells us here to be rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as you've been taught. Uh, all this, he says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Well, philosophy. We get into philosophy. David hits on this every now and then. He says he's heard everything from chewing gum to shiny belt buckles to all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you what, that's philosophy. That's somebody sitting down and saying, that just don't seem right to me. I've got a scripture over here that I can make it say that if I want it to because it don't seem right to me. I'm going to make it say that. It's going to sound right to a lot of people, folks. There's a lot of people following that. What was that guy's name? Uh, the Jones? Jim Jones. I don't know how many people was it that died. Uh, 900 people or something. 960 people followed him to their death. To their death, folks. It's going to sound right to a lot of people. There's a lot of people. I, I don't know if anybody follow me like this or not, but there's a lot of people. If somebody stood up here and said, don't wear shiny belt buckles, a lot of people would pull them off, folks. Why? Because somebody was able through some kind of philosophy to twist it around and make the word say something that it don't, folks. We got to be careful, and we got to be. We must be learned in this word ourselves. He says, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Well, he goes on down here, and he says, if I can find it here, buried with. Him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and all trespasses, uh, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. The cross is an instrument of death. And he, he took all this, this man-made tradition, He took all this, uh, all of our sin, and all this, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. He took all that, folks, and He nailed it to His cross. He took that to the place of death also. But we'd rather teach traditions of men. We'd rather teach that th this is what makes sense to me. You know, uh, if you look at it like this... Well, what about it? That don't, well, what about if you look at it like this? You know, we care more, folks. Uh, there's a lot of people out here caring more about what we think than what God Himself says and thinks. A lot of people doing that. It says that we're complete in Him up here. Uh, I skipped it in verse nine. He says, "For in Him dwelleth all the fullness uh, of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him." You're complete in Him. If we be in Christ, we're complete, folks. If you're incomplete, I mean, it's an equation. If you're incomplete, then you must not be in Christ. You must not be in Christ. We got people. I'm going to hush here pretty quick. I, I don't know how long I've been talking, but if it don't feel like too long, maybe it feels like a long time to you all. Everybody. People with millions of people following them. And teaching a false doctrine, a false gospel, a false Christ. These are false teachers, folks. Oh, God loves you. He wants to bless you. You send me $10, you'll get 100 in the mail from somebody else. All that kind of stuff. Listen, uh, oh, God loves you. You're suffering. You, you need to send me some money. Uh, God don't want His people to suffer. I looked just this morning, I didn't count them, but in the New Testament alone, I'm sure there was over a hundred times 
that there was some form of the word suffer. Suffer, suffers, suffered, suffering, something. I got some of them over on here. He says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy pleasures of sin for a season. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than evil-doing. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Does that sound like the teaching that's going out today? No. Everything I hear and everything I see, you know, you get on the computer, oh, here's the quote of the day from Pastor so and so. Uh, God loves you and, and you can overcome everything in this world. You never have to suffer. Well, I don't know what it is they say, folks, but I see that constantly. That's brought in constantly. And everybody wants that. That's what everybody wants to hear and see it is a, a faith that will just give them everything they want but never require anything of them. That's what everybody wants. A faith that they're just looking for a, a Jesus that's going to pull a rabbit out of a hat whenever they need Him to. Oh Lord, I need You now. You know, like we said here the night, live for me, God. He says, no, I'm, I died for you. You live for me. Lord, I need you. Oh, no, Lord, I don't need you today. You know, I'll just, I'll get back to you when I need you again. Don't call me, I'll call you. That's about how we treat the Lord anymore. Everywhere you look, some false teacher, something going out. Something causing division, causing strife, causing all this. And the problem is, the people who suffer for it, and I've not suffered, don't don't take me wrong. Nobody's come into the church and said, oh, uh, you're just wrong and all that kind of stuff. Nobody's done me that way. But most of the time, it's the, the man who's standing uh, trying to preach the truth to somebody, trying to get out a message that, that he's been broken of, uh, trying to get out a message that he's just worried and, and wept over and all that stuff already. He's trying to get out a message. He's the one who's going to suffer because somebody's going to hear that false teacher and come in and say, oh, but they said this, and they have church in a football stadium. They must know more than you. Listen, i got one more verse here. Somebody, you guys come on and be getting a song. Romans 1 and 25, it says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They changed the truth of God into a lie. They used the name of God. Everybody says, well, you can't confess Jesus unless you're a Christian. No, folks. Oh, the devil knows he's God. Don't think that he's got a problem with saying Jesus. Oh, but when we say Jesus, all the devils in hell fear and tremble. Oh, that's if that word Jesus comes from the right place in our life, folks. That's not just to spout it off. Now, I've heard it come from every kind of place, every kind of place, used in every kind of form, uh, used right along with profanity and all that kind of stuff. Surely you don't think you're scaring the devil to death when you use the name of the Lord in vain. Surely you don't think that. Folks, I don't know. don't know who it's for this morning. got no idea. But it's, it's for somebody. So as we stand, please come and pray. You've been my love.